the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to proclaim all who mourn to provide for those who mourn in, in Zion to give them a garland instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit we come today as people who are surrounded by suffering and grief and yet the spirit hovers among us tending and anointing inspiring freedom where there is captivity declaring blessing in places the world has cursed and igniting fierce joy where mourning and heartache prevail Jesus tells us in John 16 24 until now you have asked for nothing in my name ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete we stand with me we wait as people who experience hardship and pain yet we are called to witness and to the persistent joy that sustains our life as God's people. We light these candles as signs of our shocking hope, just peace, and fierce joy. May our lives shine with the fierce, tenacious joy of the light who lives in our hearts as we wait and work for the coming of God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. talked about peace in Christ and this week we're going to be talking about joy. Romans 15 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. When we have peace and joy in Christ, we have hope in the one who has come.
it's time for announcements. Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you will connect with God and build community with Christ's followers. Connection cards aren't just for new people. Fill one out to get involved, volunteer, join a ministry, or even update your contact information. You can also use one to let us know how we can pray for you this week. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates, or if you're having trouble receiving our emails, please contact the church office. Sermon questions for small group or personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MACC. If you're new here, we invite you to join us for our next Discover MACC dinner. It's an opportunity to enjoy a delicious meal and engage in a short discussion about who we are as a church. Adults, please sign up for a winter education class. The sign-up flyer is located on the tables at the back of the worship center and in each adult ed classroom. You can place your completed sign-up flyer in one of the offering boxes. Classes start January 7th. Hello MACC, my name is DJ Goble, youth minister here at Maple Avenue. I just wanted to share with you all about upcoming classes we have Sunday mornings for our junior high and high school students. Through these next 12 weeks, we will be going through three different four-week classes talking about how to deal with anger, our true identity through Christ, and spiritual growth through setting up patterns and routines. Can't wait for you to join us. Hi, I'm Amy Morris, and I'm the children's minister here at MACC. In January, in Kids Connection, the kids will be learning about responsibility. They will learn to take responsibility and use what they have wisely to lead others to Christ. I hope your kids will join us. Have questions about the Christian faith? Looking for a space for open and honest conversations about life's biggest questions? Join us for Alpha, an 11-week series that begins Tuesday, January 9th at 6 p.m. To learn more details about Alpha or volunteer to help on the Alpha ministry team, see Kim Martin after service at the adult ministries table outside the worship center doors. The children's Christmas play is today at 2 p.m. All are encouraged to attend. Our Christmas Eve morning service will be at 9 a.m. It will be a family service for all ages. There will be no separate children's services. Giving envelopes are now available. You can find them on the table near the cry room. December 31st isn't just New Year's Eve, it's our quarterly fellowship brunch. Be here at 9 a.m. with a dish to share. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, can't say we didn't tell ya. I'm the senior minister here at MACC, and I hope you're as excited to be here this morning as I am, because this morning we get to come together to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a church family. Uh, if it's your first time here, I want to personally invite you to stop by our hospitality room after our service. Just go out the doors in the back. There's a red wall there. Uh, you'll see it says hospitality room, and there's something I want to invite you to uh, next month, so make sure you swing by there. If, uh, we also know a lot of people check us out online, uh, so we want to say hello to you folks. Uh, we hope to see you here soon. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before uh, I jump into our passage this morning. Uh, this morning we were going to have uh, Jesse and Brandy Patton come forward. We were going to pray with them because this is going to be their last Sunday here at Maple Avenue Christian Church. Now Jesse has uh, been on staff at Campus Students for Christ. Uh, and has been working there, so he's transitioning out of that job. He's taking a full-time ministry position down in Quincy, uh, but we were going to have them come forward and pray with them, but they were all under the weather. I'll spare you all the details, uh, but they were not feeling good, so they are not here with us this morning, but you know what? 
we can still pray for them. So if you would, would you join me as we pray for them as they make this transition in their life. Father, we come to you and we thank you for family. We thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for the ministry that Jesse and his family have been doing here at Maple Avenue, at Campus House, what Brandy's been doing in, in Macomb schools, all these things, what they've meant to so many people here, the way they've gotten plugged in and involved in different ways. Uh, we're going to miss them, and we wish them the best as they move to Quincy, as they take on this full-time ministry. God, I pray that you would prosper their ministry that what they do and what they say and how they get involved there would just truly bless the people in that area. I pray that they would be a church that uh, uh, is faithful to the Word of God uh, each and every week. I pray that you'll bless Jesse as he preaches each week, that you will sustain him and you will protect him because we know that our enemy wants to attack us Anytime we're standing up for the truth of God's word, I pray that you will surround him with your love and your grace. I pray that you'll protect his family because Satan attacks our families. We know that well. And so as excited as we are for them as they are making this transition, we are also uh, just lifting them up for, your prayer, for prayers of protection as they serve you in this way. And we do pray blessings on their ministry, on their church, on their home, on their family. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, folks, um, <clears throat> this morning we're going to continue in this series we're in. This ser and if you're new with us, we're in a series called Best Christmas Gifts Ever. Now, in this series, we're not saying that there is a gift of equal or greater value to Jesus because there's not. But what we're saying is that Jesus has given us some of the greatest gifts that we can ever know. Jesus is, uh, he, Jesus gives us the best gifts ever. That's what we need to keep in mind. This morning, we're going to open our next gift that comes from Jesus. And this gift is, anybody want to take a shot? Ah, oh, they all beat you to it, guys. <laughs> but it's joy. Let's see if we can do this without knocking stuff down. Yeah, sort of. He gives us joy, and that's what we're going to focus on this morning, the joy we have that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. This third Advent Sunday is traditionally known as Gade Sunday. Gade, when translated from Latin, means rejoice. We know that Advent is a season of waiting. We've talked about that through this series, and today we're called to be joyful as we wait for the coming of Jesus Christ. It's hard to be joyful when we're waiting for things, isn't it? Just look at the person sitting beside you in the car that's waiting on the red light. They're not always joyful. Or go to the DMV and you're waiting in line. How many of us are joyful as we're waiting for that? It's hard to be joyful as we wait. But we know that that's what we're told to do. God through the prophet Zephaniah. By the way, that's what we're studying right now in our um, staff devotion, Zephaniah. But God through Zephaniah offers us a glimpse of a hope, a future, and calls us to sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, he reminds us of the ways God has delivered us, is delivering us, and will deliver us, and he invites us to shout aloud and sing for joy because, as Isaiah says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And of course, you can't talk about joy without mentioning the Apostle Paul and his statement in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 4, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. One of the things people love about Christmas is that it truly is a joyful season for most of us. I do understand that for many of us, it's a struggling time of year. 
It's hard to have joy when we're not at peace. It's hard to have joy when we're missing people who were so influential in our lives. It's sometimes hard to have joy with a debt hanging over our head, not knowing how we're going to pay our bills. All these things come about. They don't go and take a break at Christmas time. But in spite of all that, in light of all that, we can still have joy. And that's what we'll talk about today. But many people like this time of year because of the sense of joy they have. All season long, we celebrate with music, special music that we don't hear any other time of the year. We celebrate with songs and lights and decorations. We celebrate by getting together with family and friends and by exchanging gifts. Most of the time, those are good family gatherings. Here at MACC, we celebrate by serving others. That's the way we celebrate. Every year for the last 17 years, this will be our 18th year, we have served the community of Macomb and the surrounding areas with the Christmas Eve dinner. This takes a lot of volunteers. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of planning. And if you've never been a part of this ministry, I really, this morning, I want to encourage you to sign up. I want to encourage you to help out next Sunday afternoon. And all of next week, all of next week we'll be getting all this ready because a lot of things get done throughout the week as well as just on Sunday after church. Everyone I've talked to who helps with this ministry talks about the joy they receive by serving others, which is really a beautiful picture of what Christmas is really all about. It truly is a joyful time of year. I'll admit that the lights and the gifts and the, the other stuff, they can give us the warm fuzzies. I get the warm fuzzies, and, and I have to be careful, and maybe you do too, that we don't let it become all about that. Maybe you can get up, uh, caught up in all the commercialism of Christmas as well. And that's exactly what our enemy really wants us to do. The enemy wants us to trade in the true meaning of Christmas for some hollow version of Christmas. Let me ask you this, if you didn't have the tree, and you didn't have the lights, and you didn't have the poinsettias, and you didn't have the presents, if you didn't have all that stuff, if you didn't have the music, could you still celebrate Christmas? I hope you can. I'm not asking you to go down and take down your tree, but just imagine if you don't have all that stuff, can you still celebrate Christmas? I hope so. Let me let you in on something. You don't have to wait till one time a year to celebrate Christmas. You can celebrate it all year long. We can celebrate the birth of Christ all year. We don't have to wait for one special day that society tells us is the day to celebrate. <coughs> the true meaning of Christmas is all about Christ because when you come right down to it, the real joy at Christmas comes not from the lights, not the decorations, not the music, but from the meaning of Christmas. And at the heart of Christmas is the astoundingly good news that Jesus Christ was born as the Savior into this world. From beginning to end, the Christmas story is punctuated with various outbursts and moments of joy, and they all center around the birth of Christ. Let me put it this way. Jesus is the joy giver. Jesus is the joy giver. He's the one who supplies the joy we have. You can't get away from it. You can't get around it. You can't spell Christmas without Christ, and you can't enter into true joy of the season without Jesus. It's just not possible. This morning, I want us to consider three truths about joy at Christmas. One, Jesus brings the joy of salvation. Second, we share the joy of Jesus with others. And third, the joy of Jesus erupts into worship. That's what we're going to talk about because all three of these truths are found right in the very verse, this passage, that's going to tell us about the Christmas story. And so all three of these truths together capture the true meaning of joy at Christmas. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 2. We're going to read verses 8 through 14, Luke 2, 8 through 14. And so if you'll stand with me, we'll, I'll read this. I want to invite you to follow along, if you would. Luke 2, 8 through 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. 
Verse 9, an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Father God, we thank you for the way Luke lays this out for us. We thank you for the promise of this passage. We thank you that we can know for sure that Jesus is the Messiah, a heavenly birth announcement given to simple shepherds who experienced it firsthand and who shared this joy with others. We thank you and we pray that we honor you in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat, thank you. Well, the first thing, that we want to talk about look at is this. Jesus brings this joy of salvation. Jesus is the joy giver. He brings the joy of salvation. Now, Jesus brings joy in so many areas of life, but the joy that is especially associated with Christ's birth is the joy of salvation. Last week, we talked about how Jesus' very name means salvation. Remember? Yeshua, Joshua, uh, God saves. That's what we talked about. And I want us to see the connection that the Bible makes between salvation and joy. Salvation is deliverance from danger. Okay? It's deliverance from suffering. And so to save is to deliver. It's to protect. The word carries the idea of victory. It carries the idea of health or preservation. Sometimes the Bible uses the, the, the words saved or salvation to refer to temporal or physical deliverance, you know, such as when the Apostle Paul was delivered from prison. That was a temporal, that was an earthly salvation. He was brought out of that prison. At other times, the word salvation concerns an eternal and spiritual deliverance, like when Paul told the Philippian jailer, what he must do to be saved. He was referring to the eternal destiny of the jailer. This is what he says in Acts 16, verses 30 through 31. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Jesus equated being saved with entering the kingdom of God. Listen to how he said it in Matthew 19, 24 through 25. He said, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And so when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and they asked, who then can be saved? Anyone can be saved who surrenders their life to Jesus Christ, who repents of their sin and submits to him. Notice not one time did I say anyone who goes to church every Sunday morning. I didn't say anyone whose parents were preachers or involved in ministry. I didn't say anyone who serves on a committee at a church. No. All that is born out of the fact that we have surrendered our life to Christ. We've repented from sin and we have given ourselves holy over to him, and he's the one who tells us what to do. So this all leads to the question, because some of us are asking, maybe, what are we saved from? What is it that we're actually saved from? In the Christian doctrine of salvation, we're saved from wrath. That is, that we are saved from God's judgment of sin. Now, I want to encourage you, if you don't take notes and all that stuff, that's fine, but write this down, because you need to know this on your own, and don't just trust me up here saying this, okay? But I want you to go to Romans 5 this week. I want you to read that. I want you to read 1 Thessalonians 5. Those two passages, read those two chapters this week. 
They talk about God's wrath and how we're saved from God's wrath because of what Jesus has done. You see, our sin, our sin has separated us from God, and the consequences of sin is death. That's in Romans 6, so just keep on reading. Biblical salvation refers to our deliverance from the consequence of sin and therefore involves the removal of sin. But there's nothing you can do that you can do in your own strength, in your own mindset, there's nothing you can do to remove that sin. Absolutely nothing. We're saved from both the power and the penalty of sin. And when you know you are escaping the wrath of God, guess what the natural result is? Joy. <laughs> you don't live under that. Only God can remove sin. Only God can deliver us from sin's penalty. And God did so through his son, Jesus Christ. The shepherds understood exactly what the angel said. They said, the Savior is here. God has rescued us. Through this one who is born and is laying in a little manger, in a stable, filled with animals, God has saved us. John 3, 16 through 17. Most everybody knows that, but listen to it. Don't just repeat it. Listen to it. Know it. For God so loved you and me. He loved this world. He loves humanity. And it's beyond humanity. He loves all of his creation. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God is the true gift giver. And he's given us his one and only son. That whoever believes, and that does not mean that you believe that Jesus existed. It doesn't mean that you believe that he was a good teacher. It doesn't mean that you believe he was moral. What it means is, I believe in him so much that my life depends on it. I believe that the work he did is the only way that I'll be made right with God. Nothing else will do it. So he says that whoever believes in him, in Jesus Christ, shall not perish. That word perish, what it's alluding to is suffer under the wrath of God. If you believe in him, you won't have to suffer under the wrath of God but you'll have eternal life. And I love verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Not this time. Not this time. But it's coming. That's what this whole Advent thing is about. This is our awaiting his second coming because when he comes again, he will condemn the world. He will judge the world. And those who do not know him, those who do not have a relationship with him, those who have not surrendered their lives to him, they will perish. And that may describe some of you in this room this morning. That may describe some of you who are listening online. And God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants all to come to a saving relationship with his son. But he didn't send him into the world to condemn the world, not now, but to save the world through him. He saved the world through his one and only son. Specifically, it was Jesus' death on the cross and subsequent resurrection that achieved our salvation. Scripture's clear that salvation is the gracious, undeserved gift of God. And it's only available through faith in God's one and only Son, Jesus Christ. So how do we receive this gift, the joy of salvation? How do I receive that? Well, we're saved by faith. And it involves a couple of things. The first thing is I've got to hear the gospel. I've got to hear the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. Then, after I hear that, I have to believe it. I have to fully trust the Lord Jesus, that he's the only way that I'll be made right with God. And so this involves repentance. I, I love this word repentance because it reminds me of what we're supposed to do. And this is something we have to do regularly. I mean, we really do. Repentance is 
I'm walking in this direction. I'm walking toward sin. I'm walking toward Donnie Case's own desires. I'm pursuing all the fleshly things that I want of this world. And when I repent, when I accept Christ as my Savior, I turn my back on those things. It's a military term. It means to do an about face. And so I turn my back on those things, and I walk toward Jesus. Amen. And he's the, where my focus is to be. Now, I'm a human being like you are. And as I'm walking toward Jesus, sometimes something catches my eye. Has it ever caught your eye? Or am I alone in this? Anybody else ever been distracted in your walk with Jesus? Okay, so have I. And, you're walk, and, and you, you kind of veer this way. And, and then the Holy Spirit's like, no, this is stupid. Get back on track. And the Holy Spirit convicts us. And we come, but our focus, our walk is toward Jesus. And it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. None of us are perfect, even after coming to know Christ. But our focus is on him. He is what our life is about. We, we submit to him in everything. So we believe. That's what repentance is. It's a changing of the mind about sin and Christ. Okay? That's what the Apostle Paul means in Romans 12. Uh, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's a lot of work to renew your mind. It means I've got to get rid of all the old stuff that I'd learned all my life, and I have to, to know how to go about life the way Jesus tells me to go about life. And that's where a lot of Christians, we really struggle. We, we add Jesus on. He's an add-on to our life for a lot of us. We just kind of sprinkle him in like he's salt or something. Like we just want to add a little flavor to what we're having. No, he has to be the substance of our life. We call on the name of the Lord. Then we walk obediently with Christ and surrender to him daily. It's a daily surrender. It's a daily walk. We sacrifice our desires for his desires. And this walk of obedience begins with our baptism and then a life of devotion to him. There's no true joy without salvation. And there's no true salvation without joy. The two go together. And they especially go together in those scriptures which tell us the Christmas story. For example, we read in, in the Gospel of Luke how when Mary was pregnant, right, with Jesus, what'd she do? She went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, right, in the hill country of Judea. So Elizabeth was also pregnant at this time, right? She was pregnant with John the Baptist. So let's pick up the story in Luke 1, 39 through 45. At that time, Mary got ready and she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Listen, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord will fulfill his promises to her. I love this scene. Just let your mind play through it. Imagine you're there. The baby inside her leaped with joy. Mary enters the house, and John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit from the womb, starts jumping for joy. He's jumping for joy. He's excited. Why? Because as Elizabeth put it, Mary was the mother of her Lord. The Lord is there. Jesus is Lord. Mary was Jesus' mother, and John was in close proximity with Jesus, who had come to bring salvation for all people. And so John begins jumping with joy in his mother's womb. And you might wonder, how is that possible? Well, it's because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you have, listen to this. Think about this. This is the scene. You have two members of the triune Godhead together right there in this one little house in this small little town in the hill country of Judea. 
that wow you? <laughs> you have two members. You have God the Son growing in the womb of Mary and God the Holy Spirit filling John the Baptist in the womb of Elizabeth. And they're there together. There's excitement. At least I think there would have been. Maybe not. <laughs> now the Holy Spirit's role is to glorify Jesus as Savior. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit's job is to get excited about Jesus. And so when Jesus enters the house in Mary's womb, John the Baptist, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, he gets excited about Jesus because the Savior's come. Another great example of Jesus bringing the joy of salvation is the wise men in the Gospel of Matthew. They traveled a great distance just to see the Messiah, just to worship him. They'd seen a star in the east, but they didn't know exactly where this child was to be born. So they stopped in Jerusalem along on their journey, along the way, and they asked King Herod for some additional information. Now again, Jesus is probably somewhere around two to four years old by the time the wise men finally found him. So just so we're clear, the wise men were not in Bethlehem. They weren't around a manger. So let's make our nativity scenes proper. Let's make them biblical because that's what's going on. So this is not a nativity scene, okay? But it is a part of the focus that Jesus is the Messiah and that he brings the joy of salvation. Because we read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, after they had heard the king, the wise men, after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose, went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were what? Overjoyed. You can say it with enthusiasm. This is a day of joy. They were overjoyed. Once again, they rejoiced. Here's what it sounds like. They were overjoyed. We can be joyful. Once again, they rejoiced. They rejoiced to find the place where Jesus was. Why? Why? Because Jesus was the Messiah who had come to bring salvation to his people. Listen, these magi, they'd been studying, not these particular ones, but the people who were magi, who grew up in that line of work, they'd been looking for this star since the time of David being in Babylon. They were expecting this. This is long awaited. Six, seven hundred years they've been waiting for this. They couldn't wait. And so when they see it, they take off on their journey. Now, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, we've got that song. Bruce and I were talking about this this week. We have that song. You know it. We three kings of Orient are. Okay, first of all, there was probably a whole lot more than three kings. They probably had an entourage that would fill Jerusalem. Okay? There was a lot of them traveling together. Why is, why is it that we think there was only three because of the three gifts? That's more than likely why. But a whole lot more than just three. Why do we think they're from the Orient? Nothing in Scripture tells us that. As a matter of fact, if they saw a star in the east and they traveled to Bethlehem eastward, that would mean they came from where? The west. Well, what lies west of Jerusalem, of Bethlehem? Egypt. Yeah, absolutely, you name it. Egypt. Egypt, Europe, whatever, you whatever you want to call it. But probably they came from the west and traveled east. They didn't come out of the east traveling west. Anyway, sorry to ruin your We Three Kings song. <laughs> There's a lot of false teaching that happens in some of this stuff. Anyway. But they rejoiced because they knew that Jesus was the Messiah who had come to bring salvation to his people, even them. 
Salvation and joy belong together, and joy and Christmas belong together because Jesus came to bring us joy, especially the joy of salvation. Jesus brings the joy of salvation. Something else, we share the joy of Jesus with others. That's what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to share the joy of Jesus with other people. Notice the, the, the news about Jesus' birth is not only news, but it's what? It's good news. Thank you. And, and it's not only good news, it's good news of joy. And it's not only good news of joy, it's good news of great joy. And it's not only good news of great joy, it's good news of great joy for all the people. But how will all the people know about this good news of great joy unless we share it with them? We share good news with each other all the time, right? When something good happens, we talk about it with our friends at work or at school. Lord knows you can't have something good happen without posting it on Facebook and sharing it with everybody. When the good news uh, is birth of a baby, we especially share it with others, don't we? I mean, we send out a birth announcement cards, and we pull out photos, you know, and, and show them to everybody, and, and we're just excited about that. Heck, we even have pregnancy announcements, you know. Hey, we're carrying two now, or we're carrying one, or whatever. You know, the birth of a child, it's exciting. Many of you know, Keetra Russell just gave birth to twins, and last I heard her they're, uh, they're doing okay. They're up at the NICU in Peoria, so keep them in your prayers. But it's exciting. Grandpa Todd texted me. I mean, right in the middle of it. Hey, here's what, yeah. So, you know, so because we're excited. We're excited about the birth. It's a great thing. When good news happens, we share it. We take pictures. We send out all this stuff. We're filled with joy at the birth of a child, and the joy that naturally leads to is sharing we want everyone to know and to share in our joy. Well, if we tell everyone about the birth of our own babies, how much more should we tell people about the birth of the Son of God? Good news is for sharing. And there's no better news than the news the angel shared with the shepherds that first Christmas. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. So, what did the shepherds do after they received this good news of great joy that was for all the people? Well, in Luke 2, 15 through 18, it tells us the angel had left them and gone into heaven, and the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. So they left their sheep, more than likely. They hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, see what they did? They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. When the shepherds heard this good news of great joy that was for all people, the first thing they did is they checked it out for themselves. And they found everything just as the angel had told them. And after that, they went and they did what they were supposed to do. They spread the word to others. Why? Because good news is for sharing. This was good news of great joy for all the people, and it would have been wrong for them to keep it to themselves. Just like it's wrong for us to keep it to ourselves. If you have that relationship with Christ, it's not a suggestion, it's not just a good idea. It's a command from Jesus himself to each one of us to share that good news with others. We want to change the attitude of our culture, share the good news of Christ. Oh, you might get persecuted, but you also may bring joy into someone else's life. I find it interesting that the angel's birth announcement leads the shepherds to sharing with all people, and Jesus' final command to his disciples was what? To share the gospel with all people. So Jesus, he brings us the joy of salvation, and then we are to share the joy of Jesus with others. And finally, the joy of Jesus, you know what it does? It erupts in worship. 
Listen to verses 13 and 14 again, okay? Suddenly, a great company, a great company. So whatever you're thinking is a great company, think bigger, okay? A great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. They are what? They are praising God. Now, some people argue, well, it doesn't say they were singing. Angels, you know, singing and all that stuff. It doesn't say that. They're praising God. Well, this word praise comes from the Greek root word aneo. And aneo means the joyful praise of God expressed in doxology, hymn, or prayer. I believe it was a hymn. They were joyfully expressing their praise to God. When you joyfully express your praise to God, what usually happens? Nothing. Do you? There you go. We sing. We shout out. We're excited. That's joyfully praising God. And that's what these folks were doing. These heavenly hosts, this great company. It was probably the loudest concert ever. Just for these shepherds. The angels, the messengers themselves erupted in worship at sharing Jesus with others because they know the joy of salvation he offers to all people. This is the meaning of Christmas. And then we find this same pattern also with the shepherds when they return from sharing the good news of Jesus with other people in the town. Listen to Luke 2.20 and then see, does this reflect my life? Luke 2.20, the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. The shepherds shared the joy of Jesus with others and this erupted in worship and so they returned glorifying and praising God. God chose them to be eyewitnesses to the birth of Christ and they would never forget the things they had heard and seen that night which were just as they had been told. Let's not forget that worship erupted before this night of angels and shepherds. Did you know that? The first example is Mary. After she hears the words of prophecy from her cousin Elizabeth, after John leaped for joy in the womb, Mary was filled with joy and wondered as her cousin spoke words of blessing and favor over her and the child she carried, her joy could not be contained. And so then she burst out in a song of praise in worship to God. And Mary sang this in Luke 1, 46 through 49. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. Do you know what we call this? We often call this Mary's song or the Magnificat. As Mary magnifies and glorifies the Lord for choosing her to be the mother of Jesus. And notice that this joy still has to do with salvation. Mary rejoices in God, her Savior. She's filled with joy at God's goodness to her, and her joy erupts into worship. And so the third candle, this pink candle that we lit today, is the candle of joy. And it reminds us that Jesus brings the joy of salvation. And it reminds us we share the joy of Jesus with others. And it reminds us the joy of Jesus erupts in worship. And these three aspects of joy at Christmas also become three application points for us 
as we respond to the message this morning. First of all, Jesus brings the joy of salvation. Simple question for every person in this room. Do you know Christ as your Savior? It's the most important question that you'll have to answer today. You're either going to answer yes or no. There's nothing in between. It's either yes, I know him, or no, I don't. Do you know the joy that comes from having Christ as your friend and having your sins forgiven? Do you know the joy of being restored to a right relationship with God through Christ the Savior? You see, the message that the angels gave to the shepherds that first Christmas night is just as applicable to you and me 2,000 years later. Right here, right now. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Do you acknowledge him as Lord? There's no true joy without salvation, and there's no true salvation without joy. Jesus is the reason for the season. I know that's cliche, but he really is. And if you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, then you're missing out on the true joy of Christmas. Secondly, we share the joy of Jesus with others. If you do know Jesus as your Savior, then you need to spread the word. It's not a suggestion, it's a command. You're commissioned. Like an officer in the military, that's your commission. How many people have you told Jesus about this Christmas season? Don't raise your hands, don't shout out. Just think about this. During this Christmas season, what have I talked to people more about? Have I talked to them more about Christmas songs? Have I talked to them more about Christmas trees? Have I talked to them more about all the hectic stuff going on to get ready for Christmas? What have we talked to people more about? Well, what we need to talk to people more about is the birth of Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior, and how he desires to be in relationship with them. And you don't need to be a trained theologian to share Christ with others. You don't. Just tell them that Christmas is all about the birth of Christ who came to be our Savior. You know, I had an opportunity Thursday <clears throat> to go to Miss Morris's second grade class, and I read to her class. And that's exactly what I read about how the birth of Jesus had been prophesied long before it ever happened. And we talked about the whole history of it from a very biblical perspective. And I loved it. And I was surprised at the number of kids who wrote me thank you notes and they said, we really like the book. That just tells me that even little kids, they're hungry for good news. And there's no better news than the news of Jesus. But just tell them that Christmas is all about the birth of Jesus who came to be our Savior. Tell them Jesus died on the cross for our sins so we could be forgiven. Tell them Jesus rose from the dead and that he is alive today. Tell them Jesus is coming back to bring peace to the whole earth. That's all very good news. And remember, good news is for sharing. And so if you know Jesus as Savior, then you know the joy of salvation and joy of sharing Jesus with others is our responsibility. And then finally, joy of Jesus, the joy of Jesus erupts in worship. I just want to encourage you. Praise God every day for your salvation. Don't take it for granted. Praise him every day for your salvation. Praise him for his amazing grace. Praise him for his great love in sending his son, Jesus, to be your savior. Praise him for his goodness and for his kindness in forgiving your sins when you repent and ask him to. And praise him for the miracle of the incarnation at Christmas that God the Son took on human flesh and was born into our world as a little baby. Are you filled with joy this Christmas season? You should be. Christmas is all about joy. And joy happens because of what God has done, not because of our circumstances around us, but because of what God has done. Joy comes from Jesus. And Christmas is all about him. Would you stand and pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that our joy does, is not dependent upon our circumstances. Because if it were, many of us would not have a lot of joy. 
But joy comes because we know that Christ and what he has done for us to make us right with you. So help us to be men and women, boys and girls, filled with great joy because of what Jesus has done. Father, we pray that we honor you in this place today with our lives and our actions, with our words and our deeds. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is working on people's hearts this morning and those who don't know you as Lord and Savior would surrender their lives to you and have the greatest Christmas they ever could imagine. We pray all this in Christ's name. Folks, we do this every week. <clears throat> We're going to have elders and staff and people in our prayer team. They're going to be available. They're just going to go to the walls on the side and in the back. And they're there for you. They're making themselves available so that if you have any questions about what it means to accept Christ and surrender to him, they're there for you. Maybe you've got a lot of circumstances going on in your life and you just don't feel happy, but you want to know the joy of Christ and Christmas. They're there for you. Maybe you're being convicted about sharing Jesus with others, and you just want prayer for boldness to be able to share. They're there for that. So whatever it is that you need prayer about, want prayer about, please go and talk to one of them. They're there for you this morning. As we sing this song, you're invited.
Some of us over the past have taken pictures of your family members, especially the children or the grandchildren, and we've made Christmas ornaments out of them. I know you know what I'm talking about. Pictures of maybe the first Christmas or the grandkids or family gatherings. Personal ornaments, like those are a special way of remembering those that we love at Christmas time. <clears throat> this year, when you're looking at your Christmas tree, think about another kind of tree that's mentioned in scripture in a passage that Paul describes the impact of Jesus' death. Paul was telling how Jesus, by his death on the cross, took sin's curse upon himself, a sin that we as sinners, we don't deserve. The tree that Paul had in mind certainly isn't a pretty sight. It was decorated with nothing but Jesus' body and blood. But think about this. On that tree could be every one of our pictures because we were on God's mind when he gave his only son. That son died for us, every one of us. And that's a lot of pictures. But God has a lot of love. So now at communion time, we remember this bloodstained tree. It may never be on a greeting card as a perfect tree, but the perfection is found in the gift that was given there just for what we needed. So as we take our communion this morning, imagine that cross or that tree, and with your picture on it, because Jesus offered up that gift with you in his mind. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Father God, I am so, so happy that you are the joy giver, and by that joy, you gave so much for us. So this morning, God, as we lift up our communion time to you in worship. I just pray that it is a holy time for you, a blessing for you. Lord, thank you so much for everything you've given us, and it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. the next part of worship, it's so important that we remember God through our tithes and our offerings. There are boxes at the back and the side of the worship center. You can drop those in on your way out. Let's pray together for our offering. God, you've given us so much. I just pray that uh, we can give back to you. Lord, may it be a pleasing aroma to you as we give in our worship time. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. One of the best ways to learn and remember scripture is to put it to music. Um, there are over 500 prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus' coming as the Messiah. This morning we're going to sing of one of those prophecies. This is going to be a new song for us. It's titled, he called, His Name Shall Be, um, which quotes Isaiah 9 throughout the chorus. So please stand as we sing God's word together. <coughs>
government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Thank you. 